Right, I'm Helen Baker and I'm delighted to welcome two peacocks to Gallery North. Um, I think for those of you who were there at the opening last night, we all got a sense that art was alive and kicking. Uh, and, you know, really it was such a fantastic occasion. Um, when John Walter proposed this exhibition, I knew it was going to be different and I knew it was going to be something that would appeal to our students um, for two reasons. One, because it is um, very much a, a current exhibition. It's about what is people are talking about now, about the idea of collaboration, of participation, about the idea of um, uh, taking life into the gallery and letting it um, uh, undermine the uh, pristine uh, white space and it's about having a dialogue that is um, meaningful to young people and doesn't just rely on historical precedents although it acknowledges those but also takes ideas forward in a way that is um, present in our lives now um, and the other reason that I knew it would be a good exhibition is because uh, it has some <coughs> excellent work in it um, and so today, what we're hoping to do is to critique that work, critique the presentation that John Walter and his um, fellow artists have made downstairs, and to um, think about what questions it has, it creates for us as artists uh, in society today. Uh, so I'd like to welcome John Thank Walter, you. and I'd like to acknowledge the wonderful works by, and I have to read them out because there's so many of them and I don't want to miss anybody out. <laughs> Uh, Will McLean, Nisha and Champaneria, uh, Nisha Champaneria and Hannah Gillespie, who of course are two of our ex-students who are still developing and doing fantastic work, Matt Breen, Diana Taylor, Ludovica Joska, Joshua. Joshua, and Jamie Quantrill and Ollie Harrop. I haven't missed anybody out there, have I? That's everyone. That's great. Um, those of you who have uh, yet to buy the Two Peacocks catalogue will find it indispensable <laughs> in as much as it's got some fantastic essays in, but also it helps you to investigate the works, not only on a, um, a, a basis of the way it's presented, but also the individuals involved. And uh, I found it really indispensable at ten pounds. <laughs> <laughs> For a short time only. <laughs> uh, I'd like to welcome our four speakers this morning. We will be uh, carrying on after lunch this afternoon uh, with an artist panel. Uh, but this morning we're going to start off with John Walter and I believe your presentation is called I'm, I'm Free. free. Yes. Yeah. Uh, thank you Helen. <laughs> Okay, um, what time is it? I'm going to try and bash through this, half an hour max. So, well, I want to thank Helen for inviting me to do this. And I should, well, there's several things I should say before I start. One is the catalogue is a work in itself. And that's something that maybe isn't a normal way of going about things. In that the catalogue is kind of a dictionary for, a, a, an, an instruction book for doing the install for the show. So really the whole methodology for making this project has been quite back to front and unusual. And that's been the point of doing it. Um, the other thing I should say is that it's not arbitrary that this has happened here. I mean, I met Helen at, at the British School when we were both doing residencies together. And that conversation and friendship that developed is now manifest in this project. And through having come here to do some teaching and got to know the lay of the land and what this place is about and how this institution functions, this is a bespoke show for this place. So I hope that that's part of how it has functioned. Um, I want to talk to you about I'm free or don't let the big man tell you what to do or do it your own way or don't do it at all, which is nothing to do with uh, are you being served. We'll just get that one out of the way. Um, but it is something to do with painting, and uh, this isn't as big as that, but I'm, I'm a painter, that's kind of the baseline of what I do, and this is a painting that's about a metre forty by two metres, maybe it's a bit smaller than that, it's on paper, it's from 2005, 
and I made it when I was in New York, and I was thinking about, well, I was a nomad, and what, what I was thinking about is how um, two peacocks is a kind of uh, project space that doesn't have a home, and in London, and in Newcastle, and in most cities, artists graduate and don't really know what to do, or they have a dream that a gallery snaps them up, and their life is sorted and money comes in and it's all, you know, there's, there, what do you do? How do you function as an artist? And being a painter, I'm sort of in my studio on my own looking at flat things and having a conversation with myself a lot of the time. And one of the th stories I'm going to tell you today is about how I've been struggling to contextualise my work within art, but also within the world outside art. Um, and two peacocks can appear at any place, in any time, in any guise, which means that it's a kind of, we're a series of troubadours that can reorganise ourselves into any, com any system almost. And, and the department store format is one of those systems. Uh, this is a painting from 2006, and it's, it's a painting that, well, they were all called Intercision which is um, in uh, His Dark Materials, those books by Philip Pullman. Uh, it's about the cut away from your, uh, I don't know what's, what, he, what he calls these sylphs or these characters that are your, the representation of your um, subconscious or something like this. And uh, these are collage paintings that are about the separation of two <coughs> images rather than the conjoinment of them. And they're painted collage. They're a bit smaller than that, and they're oil and acrylic on canvas. And what I'm trying to do is set, set for you how this project has come about for me. Um, and it's to do with simultaneity. And this is, a, this is called intercision colon lozenges. And this is a, these are breakup paintings. Um, and... I'm about to come back to these paintings. This is 2007 or 8, and I'm trying to find a way to make a cut in an image which, is, which allows for a third image to appear. A kind of critical paranoiac method, a la Dali. But that's, I'm throwing out a lot of ideas here. Um, but, the, but I want to talk about David Sally. And David Sally's my hero, really. And I just saw him speak at the ICA the other day. And I was really worried that I'd hate it and that he'd be really disappointing, but he wasn't. He kind of fulfilled my um, expectation. There's some things that are a bit wonky, but mostly he, um, he is arguing for lots of stuff going on at the same time. And that might be a light bulb and a chair and a Renaissance painting and a dog and a sandwich, but it, it's, all, it's about the way we live. But it's also about metaphysical painting. And uh, there's a very serious aspect to two peacocks, which is, which is related to this, which is that I think that things define themselves against each other. And my thinking about how to, cu <coughs> how to organise this show, I didn't say curate, I stopped myself, because I'm not a curator, but I'm going to come to that, um, is about juxtaposition and... If things are far enough apart, not spatially, but it could be spatially, but it could be conceptually or materially, they can in infect each other or affect each other or Im have an implication on each other which is poetic. And by poetic I just mean that there's an energy that's charged off it. And uh, I couldn't find a Kiriko image that I was happy with but de Chirico puts paintings within paintings and really what I've been thinking about with the show is how do you do a David <coughs> Sally that is exploded so far that it fills the gallery <coughs> and so there's lots of strategies at work downstairs that relate to this kind of I would call it ethereal space because things are floated on top of each other cut inside each other shoved visions through things enmeshed uh, it's a kind of um, it's a kind of chaos, but it's an organised chaos. Okay, so 
I've been, I was making a lot of paintings that, that is kind of that size actually. Um, and it's acrylic and oil on canvas. It's not stretch, none, none of these paintings are really on stretches. They're on bits of canvas with eyelets through them, <coughs> like some down there. And um, that's to do with being a nomad because I was moving around a lot and I needed to roll things up. And, and I'm telling you all this digressive stuff because I think people don't talk about that. Um, so this is a, a Memphis chair. I'm not sure who it's by. And this is a scene from a fresco in Orvieto that I got very interested in. But um, if you haven't seen the postmodernism show at the V&A in London, you should see it because I thought it was amazing. And uh, I think it's interesting that people are struggling to historicise postmodernism, which was supposedly post-history or something like this. But one of the conversations that has conjoined a lot of the people involved in the show is Memphis. And, f and Memphis is, a, for those of you who don't know, is a design group that was active in the 80s. I don't know, maybe you could define it better. 70s, 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 80s. 80s yeah. yeah. Led by this guy, Ettore Sotsas. Um, and it was about, well, my interpretation of it is that you take modernism and you fuck it up by putting um, like Aztec colour and pattern and you collide things that are unlikely together. And what you get is something that's not pop, but is, but has something of pop about it. Um, what interests me about this stuff is that it, it's, quote, bad taste. And I'm always interested in where the thing that is being dismissed is, and, and asking, should it be dismissed? And can I have ownership of it? Volume up. Um, so this is, a, this is the Carlton Room Divider by Sotsas, which I've made as a little golf hole downstairs. And this is an image that recurs in my oeuvre, if I can say oeuvre. Um, oh, hello. Um, OK, so this is a, an exhibition that I had at a gallery in Bologna called Galleria Marabini. And uh, I was in Rome doing this residency and somebody knocked on the door and said, oh, do you want somebody to come and do a studio visit? And I said, no, can you just fuck off because I'm really busy and I don't want to see anyone. And then somebody said, oh, I think you probably should. That's not the way to do things, is it? You should probably say yes. And so I said, um, oh, well, let's give it a go. Anyway, they're quite wealthy and they're quite um, formal. And they really liked the work. And they said, do you want to have a show at our gallery? And I said, oh. OK, yeah, let's try this out, thinking, I don't know what this is, I don't know how this works, let's, let's try it. So they, you know, they, they put you on a train, the work gets packed nicely, you, you turn up, there's a nice cocktail, a bit of astroturf, they've done out the bar nicely for us. It's in an old chapel that's been deconsecrated, and then suddenly you've got the crazy frog and whatever paraphernalia, sort of anti-Catholic propaganda that I was making. Um, <coughs> so you get a show out of this, but it's about putting paintings on white walls in a space that is a church. So uh, there's lots of problems here that I'm trying to resolve. Um, and what I'm, tr I'm trying to tell you two things. One is about the maximalism of it, by which I mean in any given space there are bits of furniture that are already there that you can either cover over and ignore or you can work with. One story is um, how people coerce you and how we are sold stories about the art world that things have to happen in a certain way. And I'm not sure that they should be done that way. Um, and this is another gallery in Germany that I worked with. And this is a this is a triangular triptych. On the other side, you can't see, there's Ronald Reagan. And it was called the Triangle of Evil. Um, and that was a very different gallery experience. And we're talking about commercial galleries here rather than project spaces. And there's a lot of confusion in my mind about the relationship an artist has with a gallery. And is it that you're asking for a parent and somebody to, or an editor? A, because in... Dealing with finances, there's a lot of stuff that goes with it which is unsaid, that is complicated and you don't get taught about at art school. That I can't go into too much detail now, but we can talk about it more later. Um, 
So precursor to two peacocks, or how to turn a pina colada into a peacock. <laughs> and uh, this is my solo show at, at Gallery uh, Ars Pro Toto in Germany last year. So this was September 2010. And I already had the lederhosen from a previous trip. <laughs> and uh, it, the show was called Pina Cateca, Pina Colada, which they didn't really understand. <laughs> I didn't really understand, actually. But they picked the title out of a list I sent them. And um, I, this is the second show I'd had with them. And I want, they didn't come and pick the works. They, I, put, I picked the works and put them in a van, and that was all very com complicated, dealing with who pays for the van and who doesn't, and when does it arrive, and all these things. And anyway, the work gets there, they unwrap the work, they phone me before I arrive and say, what the fuck, what is this? <laughs> what have you sent us? This isn't your work, this is a group show. Because if I'd been making all these paintings that were very different, deliberately, but then they weren't so different. You know, you had a Pokemon, and you had a, a sloppy thing, and a tight thing, and a text, and a this and a that. And I knew what it was going to be. I was holding the vision in a bag, but clearly they didn't have that. Anyway, then there was a big book, and they unwrapped the book, and I said, look, the book's a kind of dictionary for everything else. And then they calmed down a bit, and I arrived... And we unpacked the work, and then I painted the walls, and then they freaked out, and then we hung some things, and they cut. And we were, we were veering between trust, fear, trust, fear. And uh, needless to say, the show looked fantastic, and I hosted and read my book out loud, which was just nonsense. And all these German people, Bavarian people, who didn't speak English, didn't know what was going on. But they were quite amused that there was a man from England dressed like this, doing this. And there was a bit of AstroTurf. That, OK, so this is what I'm telling you. There, this is not a white cube in any way. It's an old sauerkraut factory. And for some reason, the gallerist, who's a big, bald man with a beard, who's quite likes his sausages, um, had put a, put a golf course in the gallery. And when, when I got there, he said, oh, so we'll move the golf course out. Don't worry about that. And I said, well, are you sure we shouldn't keep it? Uh, at which point he wanted to send me back. <laughs> and um, and I th because there's lots of pipes and they've got a bar that is a cafe during the day and there's a desk and there's lots of plugs, and there's a dog, and there's dog toys, and it's just not neutral in any way. So I thought, well, do we neutralise it, or do we just go with it? So we went with it, and we hung a punch bag, and we hung a carpet, and we put the DJ, Michael came and DJed, and we tried to make a positive of it. And this was the precursor to, to what is here today. And I've been struggling with this since since then and the failures of that show are important for the successes of this one and um, this was wallpaper that you could buy in Hornbach which is a DIY mm. store there they their DIY stores are way better than ours and I was I should have bought lots of this but I was testing out hanging a painting on a you know a wall that wasn't a, a white wall and that conversation with Ollie Harrop, who's done the photo walls down there, started then. Um, this is a show at the British School at Rome called Party at the American Academy, which was a revenge attack on a really <coughs> bad Halloween party at the American Academy, where all the Brits dressed up really well and the Americans made no effort. So we titled a show in a, in a revenge attack on them. But um, we hung our show on top of another show. So rather than deinstalling the show that was there before, we left it and hung over the top. Now, it's not very successful, but the, the idea was a good one in the sense that um, there's an accumulative process there and there's a, there's a history built in which is useful uh, because it might be, you know, when you, when you think where you might want to hang something, maybe you hang something over the gash in the wall where the plasterer missed it, or I don't know. Um, so these are the follow-ups leading to what we're looking at today and this is a show I did in London called uh, It's All Over Your Face and it was um, which is a, a Caswell song and um, these are watercolours 
and they're hung on magnets. Yeah, Deirdre Barlow's down there. Oh yeah, so is Social Croupier. Um, and I make the watercolours in batches and they're kind of the start of a cycle of things, although things are shifting and, um, and that, that might not apply in the next year or so. But um, <coughs> this idea of a salon hang as a way out of a white cube or a traditional hang um, and also things that were in my mind when I was writing about the show to begin with were the Bloomsbury set and microcosms, people that got together and made everything. They made the pottery, they made the table, they made the, the, bu the building, they made the painting. They just started again. And there's, uh, not in a utopian way necessarily, although it could be that. I thought, well, what happens if you make everything again and it's all a bit shonky? Because I'm a sort of shonky maker of things. Um, this is a show that Ludovica and I were in together. Sorry, I've stolen your slide. But um, it's called Apocalyptic. And it was curated by people we know. And I'm putting this in because I think it's important that you do things yourself and that you work with people that you know. Not in a nepotistic way, but the conversations you might have with somebody over dinner might be important when you get to work too. Um, so this is a this is very, very small drawing in reality that um, Kian and I, Kian's at the back, did together, and I, I haven't put. We've been writing songs together, um, which I, sh I, sh I shall play some <coughs> this afternoon, maybe. Um, but we've been using drawing as a tool to dialogue with in between writing the songs because he lives in Belfast and I live in London, and we were making the songs over the internet. Um, collaboration is something that I, I came to really late in the sense that I'm quite autistic, I think, and quite. Um, quite a loner when it comes to making things and I've had to find a point in my work where I'm confident enough in risking giving it over to somebody else and not worrying if they completely ruin it uh, but also to go back to David Sally my way out of appropriation has been to think about collaboration so in acquiring new information in learning I'm doing that now, not through stealing so much as working with somebody else and exchanging information. So uh, this is a collaboration with Jamie Quantrill, uh, a film that we made, and we're working on the next one at the moment. Um, this is a film still. And this is with Corinne Felgate, <laughs> uh, my, my sometimes wife. Um, I think she, she wears the trousers in that relationship. And this is a collaboration with my aunt, who was here last night, and she made the Wurzel Gummidge downstairs. Mm. And she makes felt. And she doesn't consider herself an artist or a craftsperson or anything. She just considers herself a hobbyist. And I find that really interesting, because she's brilliant at making things. But she doesn't know what to make. And I have too many ideas, so I said, why don't I siphon some of them off to you? And pimp you out a bit, as you say pimp out your aunt and um, <laughs> she's br they've turned out brilliantly and she sends me them in rolls of paper and, set, and with notes inside that say I think I got the mouth a bit wrong and I go what, what are you talking about like the mouth was wrong already um, but the, so I'm, I'm working on multiple fronts simultaneously and something like two peacocks is the confluence of those things and gathering in but it's only a temporary gathering in it's there's no finite this is Bar Jar Jar in its first incarnation at Paradise Lost Gallery which is a project space that Michael was running and uh, Michael asked me to do a show it's in a room in his flat and <coughs> I had this often words occur to me and I like them and the, the, which is how Two Peacocks started. It was a joke. And then rather than, and it becomes an in-joke, and then I take it seriously, and then I make a logo, and then people are talking about it in a jokey way, and then I think, oh, should it, then, it, then it becomes a reality. Um, and Bar Jar Jar was about my hatred of openings. And I hate going, and there's a vat of cold beers, and a lot of people in black trousers in the corner smoking and looking at me suspiciously. And I thought, I want to go to the opening where somebody says, Hi, 
How was your day? Would you like a drink? Meet so and so. Look, there's some art too. And you spend time and it's nice. And so I became that character. And I served gins and tonic and you could have lime or lemon and there were cakes as well. And uh, it was a good party. But it wasn't relational aesthetics. You know, that doesn't particularly interest me. I don't think, I think Rick Richter of Veneer and all that stuff is a dead end. Because it's all good and well bringing the supermarket into the gallery, but it, it's not that interesting. And I'm interested in drawing and painting. So I'm trying to shove the two things together to see what you might get. <coughs> this is a recent bar. This is Lesy Bar, which is in Birmingham. <coughs> and this is a, a, an extension of that. Um, this is at the Lombard Method, which is a project space there. And I want to talk about regionality quickly. I'm going to try and finish soon. That um, It's really important that you're not in London. And that's an advantage. And it's a disadvantage. But it's all, there's, there's pros and cons to being in London too. And it's not arbitrary that this show isn't in London. I live in London, but I've been doing a lot of things outside London. And there's a freedom in that. And a different conversation that I can have. And... Um, I met the people that run the Lombard Method at Retreat, which Michael runs, which is a... Well, he might talk about that later. But, um, and they've, there's a big arts festival there called The Event, and they wanted to have lots of different project spaces and galleries under one roof and have a bar. And they said, would you run the bar? Do you want it to be Bar Jar Jar or Two Peacocks? I said, well, no, let's do something else. And I had this idea that for a lesbian bar in Brighton and, and I thought well let's just do it in Birmingham anyway and, uh, <laughs> and it's capital L capital E dash lowercase z lowercase i capital B A R that's very important and uh, Leslie is a character and these characters that I've been inventing are, uh, are growing to become something else and fill out a world of colour um, which is an extension of the paintings. So uh, there's a yellow floor, the walls are painted. This is a series of photographs that I've been making. There's a toilet which on the night had donuts in it that you could eat. And I was serving drinks at the bar. <laughs> and um, I was probably equal parts scary and uh, enticing. But people react to a host in a very different way. And they treat you with a lot of friendliness that they don't when you step out of that role. And I find that interesting, and I'm, I'm investigating that at the moment too. This is a, a, a show, well, a, a project more, that I've just done in Cheltenham called The Tarot Garden. And it's at a place called Meantime, which is another project space that a woman called Sarah Bowden runs. And it's a room, and uh, I spent a month there building this installation, which uh, this character is called Masonic Yoda. And... Yeah, that's fairly self-explanatory. But these are a, a, an oversized set of tarot cards which are an abbreviation of my lexicon of images. And uh, this is another solution to the problem. On the night, I, I performed inside this large book, dancing, and there was a projection onto the back wall. Um, the curator problem or organising yourself and finding people you're able to work with. So... Um, this is Space Station Jar Jar. I'm nearly done. Um, this was a project over a weekend at the Pump House Gallery in Battersea, which came out of a conversation with Laura Eldritch, who works there, at a conference. I'm just, I'm only telling you, I'm not name dropping, I'm just trying to tell you how things come about and what you can make of them. And she said, let's do a participation, quotation marks, project, which isn't education but is about getting new people through the door and is a compliment to the main show. And I said, well, I really want to do this space station Jar Jar thing, which is the bar, but it's a portal to another world. And I, I had people that I invited to do, to put work in, but I wanted to have a, a bit like with the party at the American Academy show, install a, 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 an installation on which the work was hung. Um, hang on, what's the title of this section? Oh, yeah. My point is, I don't believe in curators. I, I'm very suspicious of them, in the sense that I'm an artist. I didn't study curation. 
and I've got strong opinions about, I've got strong tastes. And uh, if I, it would be very weird for me to curate a show. I mean, my flat is a show in the sense that I might swap a work with you and then hang it. But actually, to come into a gallery, I wouldn't want to see that particularly. So um, what I'm trying to say is, to actually put a show together in the way that we have done is about something else. And it's about finding people that, that you can work with. And they might not make the same kind of work as you. So Will's an architect. There's painters, sculptors, video makers, song makers, storytellers, sculptors. Uh, and that's not to make it... It's not to make it about the medium, it's to make it about something inside the work which is beyond the medium. And that's about personalities, and that's about conversations. And that's it. So I don't know whether that was meaningful. Um, thank you very much, John. That was fantastic. Uh, and um, I know that there's probably quite a lot of questions that people would like to ask you, but maybe if we can do that at the end because uh, we're sort of aware of time and everything. So um, I think it's Ludovica next, isn't it? Uh, uh, is it me? Oh, no, Will the play, not Razor Park. Yeah. 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 Okay. So are you okay there, Will? I think so. Yeah. You've got everything you need. Okay. So. Um, you can introduce yourself, Carson. Basically, okay. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Will McLean. Um, and as John mentioned briefly, I'm, yeah, I'm, an, I'm an architect, or I trained as an architect, um, and I'm also interested in books, and I'll come back to that uh, in a while. Um, first of all, I, 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 I had to come up with a title for the lecture, um, and I normally quite like coming up with titles of things, but I think I was a bit rushed, so I came up with something, I think it was books, buffets, and semantic differentials. Um, books because... It's something that I'm interested in. Again, I will come back to that later. Uh, buffets, I'm also interested in because it's a, it's a type. It's an old type. It's not a restaurant. It's not a cafe. It's like a, it's another thing. So I quite like this other idea of, of another thing that we kind of... You have a buffet car. You have a, a slightly frighteningly named finger buffet, you know, <laughs> etc. Okay. And then we have semantic differentials. Um, and this is something that had been bothering me. Um, in our university, which is uh, the one I teach in, teach architecture in, I don't think I don't think it's like I quite like, I think it's quite nice. Here. Anyway, the, the one I teach in, the way the people that run it, in order to get people to talk to each other, they, they come up with things like, oh, today we're going to talk about semantic differentials, just as an icebreaker. So icebreaker, <laughs> cliche, semantic differentials, and they say things like, right, so uh, how would you like the building decorated? I was thinking black. You're thinking. And you go, oh, what, white? Is that how it works? So, so, they, so you do these kind of things. And I think it's really, um, I think that's problematic because I think language is very useful. And I think we should be very careful about the language we use. And I don't mean careful like John Humphreys moaning about people using the wrong punctuation. I think that's really boring. I think be careful about the language because it, it's, it's deliberate. It means something. It's kind of, um, so I think you should invent your own language, uh, which I will also come back to you later. Um, it sounds like it's going to be a really long talk. <laughs> um, okay, so that's that bit. This is all I've really got to say, and then I'm going to share some pictures. Um, okay, blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, here we go. Um, yeah, so I'm going to show you a few projects um, where architects or and artists, and I don't, I, I wouldn't make the distinction. I think you just, call, I just think you just say artists, really. I think a good architect should be an artist. I think a good artist can make architecture, but it's amazing how, and all sorts of other disciplines can do anything as well. I just think it's just kind of, it's very strange how each area of interest defends their own territory, and I think that's really, that's really boring. I'm not interested in professionals or experts. I'm interested in artists, and I think that's, um, we should all be, you know. 
Um, God, I sound like a bloody preacher. Right. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm interested where artists and architects have create, create kind of new models or make their own models or, or congruences of things. And I think this is what John is, is trying to do or has done. Um, and I think he's done it here in a gallery environment. And I think he could take this to an infrastructure environment. You could look at transport systems. You could look at uh, energy systems. You could look at housing. You could look at all sorts of stuff. And I think the problem that everything is put in its own place is a, is a problem. So and I think what's interesting about the kind of uh, department store idea is is that some of the best kind of talent and kind of invention and all sorts of other things that have happened, that happen actually at the moment, um, happen in kind of the commercial retail environment, you know? And, which is fine, but they shouldn't just be there. You can't be in this beautiful kind of retail environment and then come out into abject shitness, which is kind of what, that's sort of okay. And I think that's not, that's not okay. Um, Anyway, so talking about abject, no, this is, this is um, a bar designed by, called the American Bar, or the Karchner Bar, in Vienna, designed by Adolf Luss, uh, an interesting uh, Viennese architect, um, or Austrian, I don't know where he's from, Vienna. Um, 1907, it's incredibly small, this bar, I'll show you in a minute how small it is, um, and he does a few things, like he does this weird thing where there's a mirror up here at the top, which then reflects this kind of slightly moulded ceiling, so you get this idea of it being sitting in this bar like it's kind of, well, there's some more bar over there or something. And actually there isn't, it's just a tiny room. Um, and it's a very kind of controlled environment. There's a strange shaped table here, there's a whatever there is, there's a nice bottle of punty mess here and whatever it is. But there's, it's very, very tiny, but it's very uh, particular and it's kind of an interesting environment, I think. Let's try this. Yeah, so there's the, the repeating ceiling thing. And he even does stuff like he sticks this marble on the ceiling and puts these funny metal beady things just to kind of make it zing a bit and make it do something else. Just funny details. Yeah, this is just to show you how big it is. So it's like five metres deep, which is like not, you know, it's like the width of this room or something. So I'm not going to give it. It's like ar architecture history. But right, OK, this is another project he did, which is, I'm just showing this because I thought it's quite funny, which is... Um, his proposal for the Chicago Tribune building, a newspaper building, which was not built. They built um, another building, which is kind of less remarkable. He didn't build it, someone else did it. It's less remarkable, except at the ground level of that building, there are bits of, st there are bits of other buildings stuck all over it. And, but, and when I say bits of other buildings, there's bits of the Parthenon, there's bits of the Pantheon in Rome, there's bits of... Somewhere, some, someone's gone around and chiselled bits off, you know, has the Parliament, and they've, they've sort of embedded them in the walls, like, you know, anyway, but it's not in this building, but, um, and I don't know whether this was a sort of joke or whether this is a real thing, but it was, he didn't win it, and then I like this plan of it, which, you know, it should be that every, because you've got a circular building, you don't have a problem with the corner office, but somehow they've still managed to <laughs> kind of make a bit of a, and I love the fact that it's a typical architect, kind of like, oh, better show where the pipes are, you know, it's just like, who cares with the pipe, you know, anyway. <laughs> Okay, so I don't want to particularly talk about my father, but this is, but so this, he does things like this, or did things like this, and then he made, um, then he does sort of architecture projects sometimes, and I worked on a project with him, and people go, ooh, so, oh, you're an architect, right, you're doing a project together, oh, right, you do the architecture, and then he does the, yeah, the art, so he does the things like that, and you think, yeah, well, I don't know who does what, but they, they like to make the distinction that I'm the professionally trained one, I'm quiet, and he is, I don't do things on things, whatever. And, um, and so that this distinction about something's jokey and something serious, and something's professional and something's uh, entertaining or something. And I think you could have both things. And this is a project that we did for uh, Glasgow in Argyle Street which was at the time it was the busiest, or the, the Marks and Spencers there took more money per square foot than any other Marks and Spencers in Britain. And it was a very, it's a very, very busy uh, shopping street. It's pedestrianised, um, and it's kind of very busy, and everyone goes there, but it's kind of crappy in the way that, like, Oxford Street is in London. I'm sure there's the equivalent in Newcastle, that, you know, where it's one of those things, it's a busy area, but it's not particularly, like, beautiful or anything. Um, 
So they had an idea, they wanted to do some, they put a mural or something, or stick something at one end of the street, a bit of art to enliven it and make it lovely. Um, and so they asked my father, and then I started working with them on it, and he just thought, no, don't make it lovely, just make it more of what it is, you know. Get all the stuff that's in the shops and get it out in the street and actually kind of like really just just tune it up a bit rather than making it nice and beautifying it and doing things with signage or signage as like people like to call it or the signage you know hey. um, and so he made these drawings in the feature things like Spudgy Like the now defunct brand Spudgy Like <laughs> and there's Dulcis and there's all sorts of other things which again if you you know you make it and then if you if this thing had been built they would have become these monuments to retail, former retail environments, whatever. And then we made this drawing of, of things. So there were like, so this was the Tunnock's Tower, sponsored by <laughs> Tunnock's Biscuit Man. We went to visit him, very funny, strange guy. Um, evidently he didn't pay his work as much, but anyway, we didn't know that at the time. This is a shoe and sausage ensemble, I don't know if you can see that. There was a big discussion, like in the local authority. They, everyone kind of liked it, that was the weird thing. We showed it and then we had a meeting with a shop uh, keepers sort of organisation, they were like, oh yeah, it's really good, but they were very worried about the fact that this sausage looked like a kind of, an English sausage, or a German sausage, it wasn't in Scotland, they also have a thing that's a flat sausage, square sausage, or slice sausage, mm -hmm. yeah. so they were thinking, and we said, yeah, but formally it's not so interesting, it's like, <laughs> it looks like a bit of heel pad, this wasn't, so anyway, so, so oh, okay, well, maybe, and then there was a record shop here, so we had a dance floor and a big trumpet that played things, I can't remember what that was, but, um, and then here is the, for the health conscious, there's a running track, so you run all the way down here, and then you go to the Iron Brew Bar and get your fix of orange <laughs> Scottish Uddingston um, liquid. And here there's a floating cloud, because there was a black cloud in Glasgow, so this is a relocatable <laughs> black cloud that actually keeps the rain off you, so it's a kind of dual purpose um, <laughs> antithetical, can I say antithetical? I can. Um, thing. So that, yeah, that's more the same. So this is the Iron Brew Bar. Which we, uh, it was going to, they had these bubbles that twinkled and F, it, F of it, it, it fizzed. It's supposed to make a noise, like a fizzing drink the whole time. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then he has made bars, my father. So this is a bar that he did for the Arnolfini Gallery a long time ago. And he did it with his architects, David Chipperfield, who um, he quite likes, David Chipperfield. He just, David Chipperfield is the current gold medal winning architect which is like the best prize you can get in this country for architecture. And, you know, I think he's kind of boring, but then he got my father to do this bar bit, and the bar bit actually wasn't boring, so, you know, maybe he's not so bad at letting something else happen, but... Anyway, it was a kind of... It was an, it was an environment based on his own um, experience of going, uh, coming from Glasgow and, and going to lively environments to go and drink and have a nice time. And I must say, to be in Newcastle, we've been to some really nice places and it's a very nice um, there's a lot of very nice dispositions in bars and places which I think you you, you know you underestimate it, your your peril um, anyway this is uh, this is Gordon Matter Clark here and uh, with and I can't remember who he did it with anyway they opened a restaurant called food in New York in the 70s I think early 70s late 60s probably early 70s oh. based on the hair um, and it was, I just think it's this idea that you take, again, you, the, the gallery thing at that point was like, well, okay, we're bored of that, we want to do things, do you do things in, on, on site somewhere, or you do performance things in other places, we need places to go and eat as a bunch of artists, so we just make our own place, um, and I think this is a good idea, and I'm not talking like some pop-up bullshit, excuse me, but the, that pop-up thing is, is another kind of, Back to the semantic problem is another <coughs> type. Everything has to become a thing. Forget it. You don't have to become. That's just some kind of way of not paying like council tax or whatever. I don't know what all business rates. You know, it's like these people set up their own thing because it was part of what they did. And I think if you set up your own thing, you don't do it as just a kind of. I think it has to be part of the work or as a kind of ideological kind of exercise in a way. You know, whatever. And I don't know whether it was any good. It was probably horrible. You know, and it probably didn't last three months. and had a row, and that was the end of that. But. Um, I think it's important to, to try these things out. This was another bar that I worked on with um, my father and, um, and Sam, my wife, and another artist and stuff. And it had the other side better. Yeah, this is a sort of leaning device. It was a very narrow bar, so you had this kind of thing to kind of go like, 
after a couple of drinks, you could sort of <laughs> drape yourself over, you know. And again, it had this shape at the back of a hat, and it was supposed to cast a shadow of like a cowboy and western kind of hat at the back when the sun came over at certain time of night and stuff. And it was very, very deliberate what you sold and what you didn't sell. This kind of whole idea of selling branded products and all this kind of stuff, it's just, it just gets kind of boring, you know. So I think it's just invent your own products or, or just don't allow anyone to have any products, have like no choice. That's kind of more interesting than this kind of Thatcherite, more choice thing, which is no choice at all, of course. Um, and so years ago, I, with Sam, my wife, and Adam, uh, who was a, he actually was a sculpture student at Slade, um, we opened a coffee bar in London, and we, again, what do you do with a brand, you know, we were like, should we do brand something, is that really cheesy, or whatever. So we called this thing the crowbar, for some reason. So we thought a C, well that's okay, that's just about enough, that's not too much, quite a bit of McDonald's, I suppose, but anyway, whatever. But then we got people to do the cups, design the cups, and this was a cup that uh, an architect, Cedric Price, designed. And he, as a proper architect, was given a commission to do something. He thinks, okay, I've got, and he said, how many cups are you gonna make? And we said, well, you have to get 10, at the time you had to, it was this crazy thing, that when they couldn't get people to print a paper cup in this country. So you, these came from Chicago, it was kind of insane. So you get 10,000 of these printed, so we said, there's 10,000 cups. And so he's like, hmm, very interesting. So where's your shop? And he, he went to the shop and he said, and where do people come from? What train, you know, and what, all this stuff. He worked out 10,000 things. He was thinking how far the litter could go, like potentially on the ends of trains and what have you. Um, so he thought he'd do something with some information on it, with various kinds of information. So, um, and this explained, what he did, he took an H.G. Wells quote, which explained the size, relative size dimension between a two pence piece, which is an inch in diameter, um, and a nine foot, nine feet, these are feet, yeah. <coughs> um, circle, and that's the ratio, at a certain distance, and you had to count the things, and blah, 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 and it was just a kind of, and there's the earth up there, and anyway, it had a kind of message to it, so, I don't know what that meant. Okay, so then architecture is products, maybe. Um, this, this is an architect I've uh, worked on with, and um, one of the books that's downstairs is an architect called Adam Kalkin. And he entered a competition for a kind of, uh, to do a cheap house, a certain kind of price, and um, that everyone could buy, but buy as a product. Stop this handcrafted, knick-knacky approach to making buildings, like, oh, my vision, my architecture. He said, no, just make a thing that's like a, it's a good size, it's got this many rooms, and everyone will want one. Maybe with some small variations. So this was his idea, and it came. He used this kind of packaging thing. So then, oh, this is just another project he did. It's just quite a nice, but it's a. He bought this house. His clients bought this house in a New Jersey forest, and then he stuck a building over the top of it. And then that's the building over the top of it. You get some nice spaces in between. And that's him, because he's American. He's kind of has that, you know. It's easy. <laughs> um, but I think he's a he's a really he's an interesting architect. John's met him. He's kind of yeah. kind of a maniac. Right? But so he thought, right, if we're going to do the product thing, you've got to do it properly. So he just he did this thing for a show, like a Jeffrey Deitch thing or whatever. God, what a, what a piece of work he is. Anyway, he did a show for this guy, and but he produced this really beautiful kind of catalogue. Um, and so this is him again, with, you know, with the dog and the whole thing. 2,000 square foot house, which is seen in America as being a, re a small family house. I mean, that's like about almost three times a small family house here. So um, we really have a problem here with smallness. But um, comes up with this name, and as I mean, in that American way, you get rid of a couple of letters and you make it. <coughs> so then he says, what is a quick house? Is it really quick? What's included? So I'm not going to go through those. What colours, blah, 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 and this, this gets quite good. So then you have choices. So you can have the quick house, the, like the basic version, $76,000. No problem. Or then you think, actually, and at the time, the Nissan G35 Suburban Sports Car, which matches the house colour, that was an extra $55,000, all right? So that was, so you have to, this is a few years ago, so you, you probably wouldn't go for the Nissan now, it might be something else. And then there was some, then there were various things, like a friend of his is on it, making makes these videos, so he was, there were other art pieces, as he calls them, uh, Ham Steinbach Pantry piece, um, and 
whatever you could have. There was various kinds of plumbing and things like that. And there was also things like a sort of strange DNA included dinner prepared by Adam Kalkin in your new home, thousand dollars, <laughs> etc. And you could also buy, I think, a thousand copies. Where's a thousand copies of his own book? Oh yeah, one thousand copies of Addiction, his own book, which is a very nice red colour. So that absolutely fills a particular kind of bookcase. So. Um, Needless to say, no one bought any of these things, but that was... But, but there was a kind of real interest in... This is actually one that he, he built. This is the old lady house, which is 1,000 square foot, and it has electric doors, so you don't have to... There's no pushing of it, anyway. And then this is the family house. And actually, there was... Lots of people wanted them, but then he just... You know, he, gets, he wants to do another project. He's not interested in... I mean, yeah, whatever. You, you could do it, and we, know, we knew you could do it for cheap and you could make a, a nice environment. And these things are right, they're, they're actually kind of beautiful and slight, so. Made of shipping containers. Okay. Now, that, that's one thing, and now this is another thing, and this is just like, this is like huckster country. So this is Thomas Edison, who like steals other people's ideas and gets the credit. Um, <laughs> and this was a concrete house that he invented, system building, fantastic. We're going to do a one piece concrete poured house. So he built this amazing steel shuttle. I mean, obviously it's bigger than this. But um, he, built, he built this amazing stainless steel uh, kind of formwork. And then he poured concrete in the top. And you get, they built one of these things. And it just, I mean, it just fell to bits, you know. Um, so he stole the wrong idea in that case. But I, I don't know why I show you that. Well, there's, people are always trying to make these factory built things. And some of them work, some of them don't. Most of them don't work. Um, but, you know, they could work. Um, but I think it's also... He's not. He's seen as being the kind of this visionary, or whatever. I don't think he is. You know, this thing, it seems like the incandescent light bulb was um, demonstrated uh, first in Newcastle, I found in the Philo Philosophical and Literary Society. Um, okay, so this is another potentially huckster, but I don't think so. This is uh, a guy called Richard Buckminster Fuller, and he is um, was a very interesting guy, and he was a. So he wasn't an architect, he wasn't an engineer, he wasn't an artist, he wasn't a poet, he wasn't anything. He'd been in the Navy, uh, had some sort of terrible family thing happen to him when he was about 20 or something, tragedy or something, and he thought, well, what can one man do to make uh, the world a better place? I mean, it, he says it much more eloquently than that. But, um, and so he tries, he talks about how can you make a new conception of housing, and I think this is what Adam's thing is looking at, a factory-made thing, but he's also thinking about using waste products and just doing things in a different way. I think at the thing, but Mr. Fuller was trying to think about how you make a whole different environment. He said housing, he thought, was one of the greatest societal ills and that we should think about it and make something better and what have you. And this was, this is a version of a house uh, called the Dymaxion House. This is a later, this is like 1948 or something. The original thing was proposed in 1928 and it was launched, no, sorry, 1929 in June 29. Um, and it was launched in a department store. And so he, as, not, as a non-architect, thought, well, I've got a good idea for a new housing type. I should launch it to a big audience in a department store. And uh, so this is what he did. And I don't know, shall I tell you about this house a bit? A tiny bit? Whatever. Well, I'll tell you about all the things it's supposed to do. So this bit at the top rotates. It sucks in clean air. It filters it. So it's hyperallergenic, the whole environment. There's nothing toxic inside. These windows are made of casein, which is we're kind of uh, it's basically cheese. Um, so see-through cheese. Um, it's all suspended off a central mast. It's very light. It's about a tenth of the weight of a normal family house. It's circular. He couldn't understand why architects or anyone else made things that were square. He thought it related to some European conception of the flat earth kind of idea of the world. And if you look at other more sophisticated societies, they weren't making square buildings. So he just thought this is nonsense. People were always worry about it. And then they all say about Buckminster Fuller, well, how am I going to put my square wardrobe, my bit of IKEA chipboard in the circular building? He said, sort of well, maybe the wardrobe's a problem, not the... Anyway. And, he, and in, to, in terms of his wardrobe, he had this evolving uh, storage system for clothes. It was a kind of rotary, whatever it was inside. It had a one-piece bathroom, it was a stainless steel moulded thing, which used water vapour, not like a very fine mist, so he didn't need to use soap, because he found when he was in the Navy the mist cleaned the grease off it, whatever, there are all these stories about stuff, but anyway. 
So this is like a long time ago, and we're nowhere near any of this. The floor was sprung, so it was very made you relax when you're in your house. Um, many, many interesting things, and we're still just clonking out the same old junk. And architects are interested in clonking out the same old junk because that's they're in the clonking out old junk business. And we just got to think. He said, "There's never a new conception of housing." And he, he, if, if he lived now or someone like him lived now, he wouldn't, this wouldn't look like this, it would look like something else. He talked about all the things that he made. He, he was very famous for his geodesic domes. He talked about all of them as artifacts, meaning the artifacts of a particular period of time which he was in, and that's the best he could do. So I think that the argument that, that, that oh, he does these, the dome guy, blah, 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 you know, just rubbish. You know, he's someone thinking about, he's a kind of thinking about humanity and trying to do some interesting stuff and he writes uh, back to the semantic he writes very interestingly and people really object to his writing because he joins words together they say it's like reading something that's been translated from german well so what german's a very elegant language so he joins these things up and makes these new descriptions of things and works very hard so dimaxian is dynamic maximum um and he's like mr slogan he used to have people working with him developing slogans doing more with less Etc. Etc. This was his. That's his kind of territory. And this is um, this is someone in shorts looking at one. This is in the uh, the Ford Museum in Michigan. They only ever built two of these things. They were supposed to be knocking them out eight gazillion a year, whatever. He didn't. He didn't like the huckster business people who were trying to who wanted to make things that look futuristic, and they weren't. He wanted his futuristic thing, and I mean it. Not like I'm not interested in science fiction, but. He meant it not in a sci-fi way. He meant the thing should perform in, a, in an absolutely different kind of way. Um, so when they said, no, we can make round things like this, and, and he went, no, no, I'm not going to, you know, it's got to be, it's got to be new. It has to be, has to be different. Um, not different, improve uh, people's lives in some way. Okay, this is a completely different kind of person, um, another architect, but again, it has their own, absolutely their own idea of making environments. This is Frederick Kiesler. Um, this is when he's quite old, in the stomach of a structure he's making, of a horse or something. Um, he made projects like the Endless House, the End uh, Universal Theatre, and they're really kind of uh, interesting projects. He also had, seemed to have his photograph taken with every major kind of artist, of, of Duchamp and uh, all, the big, all the kind of great painters um, of that period. But... So he did stuff like that, and then here's him, and I think that's Peggy Guggenheim, but he did this art of the century kind of design for some new gallery environment. And okay, maybe it's like awful, but it's the idea that you, you think, well, how do you see things differently? How do you see things, which again is what John's talking about, how do you see things against other things, overlaying things? He makes these, he designs these kind of awful bits of furniture which kind of sit like that way or this way and they go up the other way so you can lie back look at the ceiling or look forward and look at the floor or what have you um, and it's, an, it's a real attempt to kind of make some other kind of total uh, environment and a different environment to look at art or photography and sculpture and architecture and again he didn't make the distinction um, yeah, this is that he made this cinema, which is this. The building still exists, but it's not it's not like this anymore. But it was he made this kind of iris that would open up. This was in New York, so you could kind of, you know, revealing the square screen. But anyway, but um, but I quite like this this project, whatever it is. Oh, that was just a model for. I don't know what this is, should be there. But this is something I did a few years ago. They never did it, unfortunately, because they couldn't. It was, just, it was for a, sh a shop front for a record store. And he said, oh, yeah, we're still going to sell records. Yeah, I, was like, I said, oh, yeah, that's cool. I quite like it. So we make these 12-inch holes. You know? So I said, yeah, cover the whole thing with big lumps of steel and make some holes in it. And he said, oh, no one will be able to see anything. Like, you know, whatever. Who cares? <laughs> but they didn't, he didn't, they didn't like that. This, I thought, I was really excited. I read, saw this on a map in Bern, and I thought... There's like a hamburger and like library <laughs> thing, and I'm just like, yeah, my German's so bad. You know, it's the kind of, you know, it's the city library, you know. <laughs> but I thought this is, I thought, new form, back to the buffet thing. I thought this is kind of uh, some new uh, mix, mash-up thing. So I thought this could be really, really good. And I, I, I write 
stuff sometimes, and I write about new, trying to write about new social phenomena. And there was something which was I wrote about years ago called the desk fart, which was this, this phenomenon of eating breakfast at your desk, which never really t I didn't take off, you know, it wasn't, and, and no one's managed to market it as an idea. But I'm sure if someone, um, well, I'm sure someone ta someone would take it up. But I mean, I kind of like those things. It's like when someone invented this kind of thing you used to get at British Rail buffets, which was a it was a fork and knife. It had a half fork on one side and kind of knife on the other side. It's a fork knife combo. How you would eat? Just <laughs> cut it up and then eat with your fork. Cut. You know what did you do? swap? I don't know. But it was a sort of. I think this idea of pushing different forms of things is useful. Sometimes it's like novelty. Sometimes it's. Okay, and then just to end on what I'm. To what is downstairs is, um, and just to point, make the point that whatever you. Whatever you do is basically what you are in some way or other. And it's like things that you think are your hobbies or, or interests or something are actually, that is, if you do it long enough, that's what you do, you know. Um, you know, you're, like, you're still doing what you did two, two years ago, you know, don't make a career out of it. Well, that's kind of what, that's what you do. And so this is, I made a, at the <coughs> university we have, we have books in an office and students go, oh, can I have a look at that thing? So you lend books out, you know, some of them you get back, some of them you don't. So I made a joke, I made a rubber stamp, the Bibliotech McLean stamped it all over these things. So I said, yeah, look, you bring it back next time, you know. I mean, I wasn't checking it out, don't get me wrong, I didn't have a lot of desk <laughs> at the door, but I, had, I just had a stamp, so when they, I guess when they stole it, or whatever, they think, oh yeah, I got it for that idiot. <laughs> um, but it was, so it was a joke, but then when all these books are stuck on that, and you're thinking, well, this is sort of what I'm into, I quite like books, so then maybe I should just make some books, published books, um, using this um, name, you know, so so this is the Adam one, which is downstairs about the container. I didn't take this product shot. The designer <laughs> took, took this product shot, so I couldn't take a picture as nice. Oh, that, yeah, that's just to show, what was that to show? This is, back to this thing of you being, you, you put things together that you're interested in, you know, so you kind of, uh, and I've made this website, it's really, it's really badly kind of, it doesn't, it's a bit kind of rubbish the way it works, but the idea of it is you have all these things, collection of things in a bookcase, and then you, here's things that you've published, you know, this is like Chicken and the Mist, <laughs> forthcoming, John Walters. Um and so they're not all yours, like, oh, I, ma I made these, these are all the corporate Bibliotech McLean things, you think, well, no, there's, there's other things too that you think are kind of, in this case it's because they're black or grey, you know, but... Um, but um, it might be things that you're interested in. And, and I think this is kind of that idea of, a, of collections of stuff and the way that John has made the show is like, it's, it, on one hand, it's like, it's totally John's work, I think, the whole show. And on the other hand, it's everyone's own work as well. So and I think it's, there's, not a comp there's no compromise, there's no problem with that. It's kind of, um, I think that was a good, I like that. And it's, it's, I think as John says, he's an artist, he's, he's not, curating the thing in that way. It's like, it's absolutely John's thinking that makes the thing happen um, at all, you know. It's just it's like a bad architecture drawing of it. And then again, this is just like, I think this is it, this is the last slide. This is just, again, to sh this is something I'm working on at the moment, but um, it's again, you know, I don't actually wear badges, but I like, we've got a badge machine, I like, I like making them, but... Um, and it's the idea that you, you put things together that maybe you like and, and whatever, that's it. Thank you very much. Mm.